Welcome back to another episode. We head north to Illinois and find a wonderful camp spot along the Mississippi River and Loud Thunder Forest Preserve and share the remarkable story of Waverly Woodson Jr., a combat medic who exhibited heroic bravery at Omaha Beach on D-Day, but had yet to be honored for his actions. We're here for a ceremony as Rock Island Arsenal renames its health clinic in Woodson's honor. So we just arrived on site here near Rock Island. We are in the Loud Thunder Riverview campground. And uh, it's a busy season here. We got our spot <laughs> along the river. And uh, check out all the other campers that have joined us out here. We hoped to explore the 12 mile continuous loop trail, but that was a complete washout. We did manage to get in one short hike. That was exhausting. I wonder how long this trail was. Maybe there's a sign. Public trail, East Branch rating moderate. 6,500. Day three of our stay here at Loud Thunder, and it's been just an amazing experience out here. And it's moments like this where it's just peace, quiet, the gentle waves, and another beautiful sunset. Yep. What do you think? Uh, it's been great. Um, it has been a little windy, but that doesn't prevent us from still enjoying the great outdoors. First night, it did live up to its name with loud thunder. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Rock Island, we were fortunate enough to link up with Kevin, the historian for U.S. Army Sustainment Command and Rock Island Arsenal. We also reunited with Sarah, a friend and former neighbor. They each gave us an amazing tour and shared many interesting stories. First, we explored the historic clock tower building, which stands at the western tip of the Arsenal Island, reaches all the way back to the Civil War. Yeah, so the, the clock tower was originally Storehouse A, and so when Rock Island Arsenal was originally established in 1862, that was supposed to be the core of where the arsenal was going to be built or constructed. The Civil War kind of put off construction because of funding delays, 
uh, but it was constructed as, as a storehouse, so it's really unique because it's got an elevator shaft in it, um, and it was intended to store uh, not only ordnance supplies, but also supplies for constructing the arsenal. We're in the historic clock tower here at Rock Island Arsenal, and it's an amazing sight. The clock tower itself, the clock mechanism, was completed in 1868, but it's just a sight to behold, um, all of the history here, and just seeing how this mechanism works for all four sides of this tower. It's really incredible. Um, an interesting story about the clock, you know, is that it's really the original clock mechanism from uh, the early 1900s. And so it's always been kind of a, an interesting struggle, uh, a love-hate relationship trying to keep the clock running. Because a lot of the Quad Cities, you know, depends on seeing the clock from across the river. And, um, you know, it's an interesting part of the, uh, the Arsenal's history and evolution of what the Arsenal was going to be from original conception. So when Storehouse A was, was constructed, you know, they saw the kind of the momentous, uh, you know, moment or the momentous occasion of, of the construction of the arsenal. And eventually a, uh, a cornerstone was dedicated with a, uh, uh, a time capsule in it. And, um, you, you know, you think as a cornerstone, it's one of the corners of the buildings um, that unfortunately after it was dedicated, um, you know, over the course of time, information about it was lost. And so they've continually been looking for where the, the location of this time capsule and cornerstone is to try to see you know what was originally dedicated in it. We also got a tour of Quarters 1. Work began on Quarters 1 in May of 1870 and it was finished about two years later. The home was built for the purpose of providing quarters for the highest ranking officer as well as providing space for official gatherings and functions. Quarters 1 has 51 rooms and almost 22,000 square feet. Quarters 1 is the second largest federal residence in the United States, just behind the White House. Uh, the bathroom behind you there was actually a dumbwaiter, so they bring the food up, bring it in here, and so you didn't have the clanging of pots and pans in here. You just, uh, you know, had your preparation or food prepared here and then taken into the dining room for the ultimate dining experience. But uh, this was the original call box system where numbers would pop up, uh, and it was installed in 1872. Uh, but numbers would pop up when you press those buttons to say, hey, you know, somebody needs help in one of these rooms. And then the call box, or the, uh, uh, this is the party line phone system. That Over the years, many dignitaries and notable personalities stayed at the residence, including Charles Lindbergh in 1927. In 2006, the Army decided to discontinue its use as a residence. And the last occupants, Major General and Mrs. Robert M. Raiden, left in 2008. Despite being seriously injured himself, 21-year-old Corporal Waverly Woodson treated at least 200 wounded soldiers on D-Day. Heavy machine gun fire greeted Woodson as he arrived onto Omaha Beach. German artillery shredded his landing craft, killing the soldier next to him and peppering him with enough shrapnel that he did not think he would survive. In a still segregated U.S. Army, Woodson was a medic in the only African-American combat unit to fight on D-Day. In the thick of battle, he managed to establish a medical aid station and spent some 30 hours removing bullets, providing blood plasma, dressing wounds, resetting broken bones, and even amputating a foot. Woodson eventually collapsed from his injuries and was transported to a hospital ship. Days later, he asked to return to Omaha Beach. Woodson's heroic efforts at one of the bloodiest sites of the D-Day invasion did not go unnoticed. 
Stars and Stripes newspaper wrote that he and his fellow medics covered themselves with glory on D-Day. The U.S. Army issued a news release in August 1944 that called him a modest Negro American soldier who was cited by his commanding officer for extraordinary bravery. Even General Dwight D. Eisenhower, architect of the D-Day invasion and future president, weighed in, saying Woodson's unit, the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, carried out its mission with courage and determination and proved an important element of the air defense team. Still, why was Woodson deprived of the Medal of Honor? Hundreds of Medals of Honor were awarded during World War II, but not a single one went to a black soldier, even though more than one million African Americans served in the war. He never much talked about his war experiences until 1994, when the French government presented him with a medallion in Normandy as part of a celebration of the 50th anniversary of D-Day. After Woodson died in 2005, his family has been calling for the Army to award him a Medal of Honor posthumously. A bipartisan effort is now underway to ensure the Army finally rights a historic wrong. Meanwhile, details of Woodson's actions as a first U.S. Army soldier were recounted during a ceremony at Rock Island Arsenal as the health clinic was renamed in honor of Staff Sergeant Waverly B. Woodson, Jr. June 6, 1944, you're on an assault boat heading into the beaches of Normandy, Omaha Beach to be specific. That ramp drops. You exit the craft onto the beach. The hail of bullets, the pounding of artillery, smoke, sweat, blood, salt water, and you hear that cry that echoes every battlefield in our nation's history. Medic! Medic! And through the hail of bullets, the dirt, the sweat, the smoke, the pounding artillery, a young sh soldier shows up with his aid bag from Pennsylvania. Every ounce of his being is dedicated to saving the soldiers in his unit and the limbs of those in his unit. For over 30 hours, over 200 soldiers that were wounded were treated, many lives saved, and then stabilized off to the next echelon of care. I am honored to have been in the same army with Waverly Woody Woodson. So today, it is our distinct honor and privilege to name what was simply known as the Rock Island Arsenal Health Clinic for a true American hero, someone whose heroism has gone unrecognized for far, far too long. But let me say that we are, in a way, we are righting a historic wrong. Unlike the army that, that uh, he served in, which regrettably actively practiced racial discrimination at the time, Sergeant Woodson did not consider skin color on the battlefield. What he did that day was undervalued and underappreciated, yet the courage he displayed was of such magnitude that it simply could not be ignored forever. Um, his actions on D-Day have been really well documented, uh, but there was a lot more that he was able to talk about um, as time went on. Um, one of the things that really, really struck him was the fact that there were so many people that um, looked at him as being a hero for that day, and he didn't, he didn't really look at it that way. Um, he was just there doing his duty. Uh, that was him by nature, uh, to actually um, help whoever he could, regardless of race. It did not matter to him. He didn't see color. And uh, one of the things that um, he was really, really most um, concerned with was saving lives that day. So he, he was able to muster through and, until he couldn't do it anymore. You know, the real significance of the renaming of the clinic was that, you know, we were able to finally recognize the deeds of a, uh, of a First Army soldier that had gone, you know, so long without being recognized. And, you know, to rename the clinic was one thing, uh, to pick somebody that was so significant to a command on the island was another thing and you know there was a lot of excitement amongst first army and the other commands to finally recognize the soldier in the little way that we could um, in, and in hopes that you know maybe it would help um, further recognition of his actions. In some small way we will try to make right by Waverly Woodson and give him his due 
by naming this clinic for him and dedicating it to his memory. I hope that everyone who passes through the doors of the Woodson Health Clinic learns about the man for whom is it named. On our next episode, we spend a month boondocking off-grid in West By God, Virginia. Between waterfalls and swimming holes, we're working on a camper renovation project that is sure to surprise. We will also share the greatest, most portable overlanding food ever, and spotlight a remarkable sawyer who epitomizes the mountaineer spirit. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell to receive notifications for new episodes. No roads, no worries. See you on the trails.